Otherwise, Rick is going to talk to you about how, with very limited means, some of you may know Shenzhen I.O., that's where this comes from, an assembly variant that he built in hardware using very little money to create a very cool thing that children and young people can use to learn assembler language. It's supposed to be a lot of fun. I don't remember being assembler being so much fun, but anyhow, here we go. Rick, your stage. Hi, <coughs> this is my talk, Shenzhen IO in real life. Which, where I would like to introduce my product, the MC5000 Dev Kit, that is an electronic puzzle game consisting of a application and a circuit board, and the task is to solve simple language, uh, simple tasks using an assembler language. About me, I have been tinkering for about 15 years in makerspaces and outside of them on various projects. These are some of the things I built in the last few years. Years. Now, regarding the current project, I came to the idea playing the game Shenzhen I.O. from 2016. Um, and in this game, you are an electronic engineer um, that newly arrived in Shenzhen in China and works on hardware. And you received tasks via email, built a use of a security camera with two blinking LEDs, and in the game you have a CAD, CAD CAD program which you use to design a microcontroller and other components or put them onto the working workspace. You <coughs> develop them, you connect them through lines and use a pseudo-assembler language to uh, write a microcontroller to solve those tasks. And you then have a simulator that you run, and you can check whether you've actually fulfilled the requirements, and then you've passed your task, and you pass on. The whole documentation is completely uh, put down in data sheets, as you find them with electronic components. And the further levels have data sheets that are in Chinese sometimes for some components, so that you have to find out by yourself what they actually do or how you use them. There are two types of microcontrollers in the game. There is the MC4000 and the MC6000. They differ in the number of lines of code. The 4000 takes nine lines and the 6000 takes 14 lines, five more. And it also has a one register more and two pins more. There are two types of pins that the controllers have. There are simple I.O. pins and X-Bus pins. Simple I.O. are analog ports, or like analog ports. You have a value from 0 to 100, as you can set there, and that corresponds to the signal level that would, um, you generate or <coughs> receive or generate and send out. You can set these and query these at any time. Let's find out what's happening at the pin at the time. Then the X bus pins are more like a serial bus. Um, you can set values from minus 999 to plus 999 there. But on the other side, a device has to be present that will take the data you send. If there isn't one such device there, the code blocks at the point where you want to set the um, value until the value has been accepted by the other, on the other side. The assembler language is fairly simple. There are 15 instructions only, and I can 
run simple mathematical calculations with the accumulator and simple queries is a larger than b or something like that are possible tests so um, in hardware i rebuilt this by taking a usb serial interface or creating one for programming i built a firmware a very cheap chinese controller the Padauk PFS 173, and I have two of those here. These are my so-called MC5000 controllers, which I can program through the serial interface, and I have a few input and output perif peripherals there on the circuit board. And these are connected to the CPUs through simple jumper wires. So that gives you the connections that Genjin IO has in its program. The objective here is to build this circuit port as cheaply as possible. It can be uh, bought readily equipped at a Chinese maker. If you order 50 pieces, it's six, five, 650 euros, six, six and a half euros per piece, including shipping. Um, the app is written in Qt5, cross-compiles for Windows, Mac OS and Linux, doesn't have to be installed, and is pre-packed for every platform, so you can just download and run it. And I'll now show you how the whole thing works. This is the DevKit circuit board, DevKit circuit board. Here are the two microcontrollers, the MC1 and MC2, both type MC5000, and they both have four I.O. pins to signal I.O., P0 and P1, and X plus X1 and X1, X0 and X1. And then you have the output peripherals, the display is the three-digit seven-segment LED display. That's an XBus peripheral. The buzzer that can play sounds. Again, XBus. Then you have three simple I/O outputs: the red and green and yellow LED. And as inputs, I have two buttons: one temperature sensor and a light sensor. Now, this is the desktop application. I have two editors here, two windows, in which I can write the code for the two microcontrollers. I can use these buttons to save the code in a file or open it from a file. There is a link here to the manual on GitHub, and the upload button saves the code on the microcontrollers. Down here you have a display for the registers. They are always initialized with zero at the start of the program, and when a program is running, this, these are updated four times a second, and the red area here shows you that there is no program on the microcontrollers at this time. If there is a program uploaded, then this turns to green. Now I can enter assembly instructions here, such as the move instruction. So let's say move 42 to the DAT register. I'll upload that. It, the, the square turns green, and you have the value to 42 here. And in the same way, I can write something into the ACC register, and you see that D23 has arrived. The whole thing, of course, the same thing, of course, works on the other microcontroller. So that has been seeded with values now again. And if I delete these and press upload, then the programs are erased and the values go back to zero. Now I'll connect a button with P0 of the first microcontroller and I'll write the value that is P0 into the ACC register. I'll press upload. The program has run. ACC shows zero. If I press the button now, ACC turn goes up to 100. So the program runs in a loop 
and always queries P0, always writes it to the register, and the buttons therefore work simply by setting the output to 5 volts, and in the hardware version the value between 0 and 100 simply is a <coughs> Um, is between 0 and 5 volt in steps of one hundredths. Now I'll connect P1 with the red LED. And now I'll write the ACC register to P1. I'll upload that. And if I now press the button, the red LED turns on because the ACC register is set to 100 and uh, this is then written to P1 and P1 lights the LED. That's perhaps a bit too complex, uh, complicated. I can do the same thing directly. I'll press the button, the same thing happens. Only the register doesn't change. That is simple I.O. Xbus works in much the same way. I can read the P0 value where that my button is connected to and write it to X0. And I'll connect X, X0 with the display. The display simply shows what it is sent through the Xbus connection. And if I upload that and press the button, then the display will, as you can probably not see too well on the screen, in reality it, it is much brighter, but you see the value changing to 100. So that's the Xbus. The Xbus I can also use to communicate between the two microcontrollers. I'll connect X1 on MC1 with X0 on MC2. And I'll write P0 to X1 now, and on the second microcontroller I will um, I'll connect this to X0 on the second microcontroller, so I'll take X0 and save it in the DAT register. Upload the whole thing, and when I press the button now, you see how the data register is set to 100 because the value from the first microcontroller was communicated to the second one. If I release the button, then it turns goes back to zero. And uh, one difference to Shenzhen I/O is that Shenzhen I/O forces you to uh, run a sleep, uh, include a sleep command which is simply putting the microcontroller on hold for a while. And for me, one time unit is 100 microseconds, milliseconds. So if I put in the number 10, um, that is 10 times 100 milliseconds, one second waiting time. So that gives you a slight delay when I press the button, a one second delay. You probably see it better if I'll make turn this into five seconds. I'll press the button. It takes a while. And now data is set to 100. Exactly. So this loop has now stopped for five seconds, then it reads the value again, writes it again and again, and, and that is the time when the DAT register on MC2 is finally reset. And in the same way, I can send something to the buzzer. The buzzer works by taking values between 1 and 75, and these are increasing pitches, frequencies, so you can, we can use a mathematical feature now, such as add. Add 1 means take the ACC register and add one to it. Because it's initialized with zero, by uploading it, I see that it's immediately put, um, set to 999. The reason for that is that the code runs quite quickly if I don't put a sleep in there. If I add a sleep for 100 milliseconds, you see how the value is slowly increasing. I'll increase that to 5 even, so the value is increased. And this value I will now 
I can now uh, transmit to X0. And you see how things happen on the display now, how, it, how the count increases. And if I now connect this to the buzzer, buzzer instead, you can hear. So, you can actually play melodies that way. Now, on to tests, conditionals, comparisons. You've seen how the ACC value has is always increased, and I now could do something such as if well, first I'll sleep again to prevent it from running too fast. TEQ tests for equality, test equal. And I will now look into ACC and test it for 50. And after such a test, I can add further lines with a plus in front, which means that they are only executed if the test <coughs> evaluates to true. So if e ACC equals 50 exactly, and lines that I prefix with a minus are executed if the test is uh, yields false. And if the value is 50, of course I have my x1 still connected with x0 on the other controller, so I'll simply move the value 23 to x1. And the second controller still is running the code that is simply moves x0 to that. So I'll upload this. We see ACC increasing. And as soon as it reaches 50, this line will be executed and the value 23 will be sent. And the data register, there you go, it shows 23. So, in this way, you can implement quite a lot of functionality and the purpose of the game is to solve tasks such as this. So, this is about uh, getting a traffic light to work. Uh, the light is red, uh, a pedestrian is pushing a button and uh, the light should switch to yellow to green. Uh, the pedestrian should have time to cross uh, the road. And uh, also there should be a countdown from 10 to zero. So uh, to solve this problem, I'm adding uh, a couple of connections. So use the yellow LED. Uh, the, the green one with P0 because uh, because both controllers only have have two simple I.O. pins and I can only use simple I.O. with simple I.O. pins so I, I'm using the second controller as kind of a port expander so uh, the remaining connections can stay as they are I already wrote that program. This is slightly more complex. And uh, we're also using labels. This time I haven't shown that so far. Uh, anywhere in the code you can add a label and you can use the jump command to jump to that particular label. So I'm uploading this now. And when I push the button, I can see the timer counting down to zero. Uh, the traffic light uh, is turning uh, green. Uh, the light uh, is uh, switching back to red. And we can do it again. The timer counts to zero. Uh, the traffic light turns green. Um, and then it turns back to red. So I solved that problem. And on the next level, I would need to add some beeps uh, uh, when the light turns green. So I started with this project last year and uh, basically uh, to work on the Paddock microcontrollers, uh, they're really cheap. 
auch nicht besonders viel können. Uh, um, but aber, uh, they can't do a lot. Last year, uh, a open source toolchain became available. Previously, there was only proprietary tools from the vendor uh, that you had to pay for. So now, uh, uh, it is supported by the SDCC compiler, and there is an open hardware programmer. So uh, I ordered a programmer and a bunch of uh, the microcontrollers and uh, played around with it uh, a bit and looked for something to do with them. And, and I, I looked at the data sheets uh, a lot and I was reminded of the Shenzhen I.O. Uh, data sheets. And so the idea was born to re-implement Shenzhen I.O. in real hardware. So the, the processor that seemed the most fitting is this one, uh, because it has an analog digital converter. Uh, so I can use that for the simple I.O. ports. And he's, it, it's also got PWM. And so there isn't a serial interface, but uh, there's an interrupt capable pin. So that uh, can be used for receiving uh, uh, on the serial port. And there's one pin that is open drain. Uh, so that can be switched only to ground. And uh, if you set it to one, it's an open circuit. Und, uh, den kann man and nutzen für you can use that das Ansprechen von to, Controllern über ein sehr to uh, communicate with multiple controllers at once Senden, as kind of a bus. Aber so uh, otherwise, uh, if you connect multiple together, they would interfere with, with each other. Sendet, uh, so uh, as long as only one of them is uh, transmitting at any time, uh, you can connect multiple to the same bus. So for the simple I.O. output, I connected uh, 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 I added a low-pass filter um, to use the PWM signal to convert that uh, to a, an analog voltage, and I'm using that to send uh, to send a signal to a simple I/O port. Uh, on receiving, uh, the pin is uh, switched uh, to in an input connected to the ADC, and uh, that works wonderfully for a simple I/O. Uh, the XBus is slightly more complicated. So we need a signal uh, that uh, the sender is ready to send and the receiver must be able uh, to tell the sender that it's ready to receive data. So, so that's the way it's impl implemented in Shenzhen I.O. And for that, I used a feature that uh, the PFS173 uh, has internal pull-ups we can use. So I can con uh, switch the pin to an input, but uh, use the pull-up nonetheless. And uh, that pulls up the pin. And, and when the output is uh, not active, and when the output is not active, it's pulled down. So, so the sender uh, raises the signal, the receiver sees that. And, and and the sender uh, pulls it down to signal uh, to to send the data and uh, sends uh, 12 bits uh, to signal uh, value from minus 999 to plus 999. So uh, these chips 
don't have a very good timing on an internal RC uh, oscillator. So an X bus transfer is relatively slow. It takes about 50 milliseconds. And that's uh, mostly sufficient. And that's, uh, that's really sufficient for the tasks that uh, are needed to be implemented for the game. So the firmware uh, was quite a struggle uh, because uh, the microcontroller has very little uh, RAM. Uh, so I need quite a bit of those bytes to store the program. And the remaining storage uh, uh, was never enough. What really helped was uh, was the compiler uh, because it actually was optimized for this architecture. Um, uh, in particular, uh, function calls uh, were using less RAM than before. Uh, and so I learned a lot about when to inline functions so uh, to, to decrease their memory use. So the SDCC compiler is not very good at figuring that out automatically. To generate the assembler code into the 65 bytes, I am doing this. I take a command like move and I'm using the upper six bits uh, to encode that. And so since, since there are only 15 instructions, that's fully sufficient. Um, uh, for, for the uh, lines that have a plus or minus in front of them, uh, depending on uh, like uh, what the previous test command was testing, uh, so I, in in the same byte, I'm using the uh, two lowermost bits to encode the plus or minus. And so that means that it won't take up any more memory in the microcontroller. The parameters are always fixed. And uh, the first parameter can be an integer or a register. Um, the second parameter can always only be a register. Uh, for parameters that can be uh, registers or integers, I'm using 16 bits. Uh, for a register, I only need 8 bits. So uh, for this line, move 42 to P0, I, I'm using 4 bytes. And in the firmware, there's a counter that, uh, that shows where we are in the program code. And uh, for a move command, uh, that is in in incremented by three bytes. And that, me that means that the 14 lines of assembler code uh, can always be stored in the 65 uh, bytes of RAM. Uh, labels uh, were a bit tricky. Uh, so I'm parsing the complete assembler code uh, to extract the labels. Um, they're basically strings with a colon uh, after it. And I'm assigning a unique ID. Uh, a number uh, between 1 and 255, um, encoding then uh, uh, by, by having um, an opcode uh, for a label and then the index of the label. And uh, when a jump uh, command uh, occurs, then I simply scan for the through the entire uh, program code to find the label, uh, to search for the index of the label, and then I jump there. And uh, that uses very little memory.
One trick uh, in the program code, uh, you can add uh, labels to lines that already have a uh, command. Uh, I added that. Uh, I added that because uh, that's possible in Shenzhen I/O. It's not documented, but it works. So my goal definitely was that any code that works in Shenzhen I/O should work on my microcontroller. Um, if you want to try this for yourself, uh, then you should uh, be able to get to my GitHub page. So, uh, I have added a lot of GitHub actions, uh, so all the binaries uh, are built automatically for the different platforms. The the CAD files, uh, the KiCad files, uh, uh, are all processed, and uh, uh, Gerber's uh, uh, a bomb and pick and place files are created uh, automatically. And uh, you can upload them to JLC PCB. Uh, um, so that includes all the order numbers uh, from JLC PCB. And uh, at early April, uh, the PADAUK chips are unfortunately not available right now. Uh, so it's a bit weird that they're all sold out right now. Uh, so we have to wait until they're available again, but uh, then you can buy all the parts. I've uh, created the layout in a way that all parts uh, uh, yeah, can, uh, JLC PCB should have all the parts available so uh, you, you can have them assemble it automatically for you. Um, and you can order pieces, uh, 5 to 50 pieces. Um, um, add uh, the pick and place option, upload the bomb files, and they will populate the board for you and and mail them to you. Uh, here's a couple of links uh, to the Git repo, to the free PDK in Shenzhen IO. And the last time I checked uh, on Google Games, um, uh, it was uh, on special offer uh, on Google Games uh, for only a couple of uh, dollars. Um, so if you haven't played it, uh, give it a try. Uh, it's a very nice game. Yeah. So I I can't hear the herald very well. So I think the herald is saying that there is uh, quite a few questions. Rick? And we can't hear the speaker. <laughs> Sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, where, where do you get the board from? So I can't hear the speaker, and uh, I'm guessing he's not on the stream right now. Hopefully, somebody will notice that soon. Bin unmuted. Bin unmuted. Hello. <laughs> ah, so fi fi finally, the director noticed that the speaker was not uh, was not available by audio. So there were a few technical problems. We have to start over. Okay, question one: Where did you, did you get the board from? Can you hear me now? Okay. So the board uh, comes from the uh, Chinese manufacturer JLC PCB, and 
on the GitHub page, there are all production files that are needed to order a set of boards yourself. If there is a lot of interest, uh, I could uh, try doing a bulk order, uh, like 50 pieces, um, as soon as the microcontrollers are available again, and uh, order a batch and send them on to people who are interested. A really cool project. <laughs> uh, so in my old age, uh, I might uh, might be convinced to actually play around with this. So next question, is that your first cool project or is there a list? What, what have you done elsewhere? I have done a lot uh, the last 10 years. I uh, am working professionally in product development, so uh, my hobby projects uh, took a back, were on the back burner. Um, and uh, so, so I, my website is Phlegmatic Prototyping. Um, and if you search for that, uh, you should see a couple of my projects. Uh, so the next logical question is, what will you be doing next? So I just heard about a project as we were uh, as we were talking uh, to the operating team. There, apparently, there's a game where you have to defuse a bomb. And only one person has the instructions. Uh, I forgot the name, but uh, it sounded like it uh, would be very nice to build a hardware version of it. And only one person has the board and uh, has to work on the board, and uh, the others uh, have to explain to them uh, how, how to do that over a video conference. So. Uh, clearly, the next question is by a person uh, that uh, is very, very uh, experienced in assembler. Uh, uh, did, <laughs> can, uh, would it be possible uh, to use the Unicode um, minus character um, instead of the dash character so it lines up uh, well in the editor? So, yeah, I, I need to f f check if the parser can work with that. Um, the, the GUI is, uh, I haven't worked on very intensively. And um, since it's an open source project, uh, if you want to improve the code editor, uh, please uh, go ahead, uh, bring it on. <laughs> yeah, the question had a smiley behind it. Uh, so, so where, where is your open source project? Uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, uh, it's released under the GPL3 license. Uh, here we can see the link. Uh, I can't see the stream, so hopefully it's visible in the stream. And all the source code is there as well for, for the board, as well as the uh, firmware, as well as the uh, desktop application. It's all open source, and you can all do with it whatever you like. And uh, I would love to see a makerspace uh, to uh, create a couple of those and um, to use that as an introduction to programming. Uh, that sounds uh, like a very nice uh, project for a Chaos Macht Schule, Chaos Makes School. So another question that comes to mind. Um, I, I wrote to Zach and I just uh, copied some stuff from the documentation and uh, because I re-implemented uh, all this stuff one-to-one -one, and he really likes the project and uh, gave me permission to do all of this. <laughs> Did you get that in writing? Yeah, I have that in writing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and the question, uh, the elephant in the room question. One, one finally, when is he going finally to ask it? How did you make that hat? Uh, uh, so this, this this has been integrated into my video feed through Snap Camera, a tool uh, published by Snapchat. And uh, I built that uh, from their documentation 
um, there's an example where you can put a crown on your head and basically I edited uh, the file and you can see that the, the hat is very two-dimensional. I haven't rebuilt it uh, as 2D, but I like it. Snap camera. All right, uh, looks very nice. Uh, here's another question. No, there aren't any more questions. Uh, I could ask you myself, uh, are you uh, planning to 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 like go to schools with this project, or do you, do you want uh, other people to do that? But uh, you were talking about a bulk order. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I'll add that to the website. Um, just a link to um, uh, uh, for people to express their interest in getting one or two boards and then uh, collect all those people and, uh, uh, and do a bug order and send them on. And uh, I'll, I'll add that to the GitHub page. Um, I'm uh, active into makerspaces. And uh, when we can uh, do uh, in-person workshops again, then I I would uh, check if uh, there's interest in that uh, and and uh, would get a couple boards uh, and uh, uh, use them in my makerspace. Yeah, it sounds like a really cool project, uh, especially in the context of uh, Karls Machtschule. Yeah, I, I noted that down and I'll stay in contact with you. Uh,